So starting actually official interview uh, with most common questions asked nowadays uh, about pandemic. So how would you say how Turkey is effective in fighting pandemic and effective in, fi- effective in, fight- in fighting disinformation? Well, uh, the pandemic, of course, has hit all of us in a very bad way. Uh, you know, all around the world, you've had millions of people who've died, hundreds of thousands of people still ill all over the world. And uh, we're all racing against time uh, in order to be inoculated and in order to be uh, having a herd immunity in all of the countries. Turkey is one of them. So far, we've had 97 million doses of uh, vaccinations in Turkey. Um, our population is 84 million. Uh, 97 million. Okay, so it's, so it's even higher than the population. Yes. Uh, we, have, we have one of the fastest rates of uh, inoculation around the world. Um, and uh, we, are, we have a system where people who work, for example, in the health system, people who work in the education system, people who work in banks, uh, people basically who work in public sector where they deal with people have to be inoculated. Um, and so if you're working in the private sector or if you're uh, not working, etc., if you're a student, university student, etc., um, you're free to choose. You can do whatever you like. But if you're going to be working, uh, serving people in the public sphere, you have to be inoculated in Turkey. And uh, now we've gone down, I think it's like in Poland, I think it's age 12 now. We are inoculating people who are of age 12 now, and people who are working in the tourism sector. So more and more Poles go to Turkey on holiday. Uh, so when they go, the people who are going to be working with them in the hotels and environment, etc., all, they've all been uh, inoculated twice. So we have a high rate, but nevertheless, um, because it's a very um, infectious uh, pandemic, the Delta variant uh, is affecting Turkey as well. So now most of the um, uh, problems we have is with Delta and now uh, schools are starting. So I think it's going to be the same in Poland Um, as everybody comes back to work from holidays. Schools are starting, universities are starting. So people-to-people interaction is going to increase. Therefore, we believe that um, uh, increase in the numbers we will definitely see in towards the end of September and October. I presume the same will happen in Poland as well. But let's see what the figures are. So we're going to watch carefully. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, are there any issues related to anti-vaccination movement? Uh, for example, in France, there are a lot of protests, a lot of uh, people that... Uh, they don't want to get vaccinated. Well, there are uh, people who are questioning whether uh, the vaccines are actually working or not. Uh, some people are also questioning uh, about this, the new technologies being applied in the, some of the vaccines. Because you know that there are two types of vaccines. One of them is used uh, using the illness itself and traditional vaccine where they take the illness and they produce an antidote using the illness itself and there's this new what is it the mrna i think uh, system and people are a little bit scared of that because they don't know what's going to apply they don't know what's going to be applied where and they don't know the the consequences of what will happen a couple of years down the line so some people are skeptical but we don't have the same sort of reaction that you see in other countries um, people who don't want to be vaccinated are not vaccinated, um, but uh, they're not complaining out in the streets, for example, or there's no manifestations as such. I understand. Okay, so uh, jumping into economy, uh, because throughout the years, and I mean, it is not a current challenge uh, that uh, Turkish currency, lira, uh, lira's dep- depreciation. Um, is, is it even considered as a challenge uh, in current year nowadays? And uh, what uh, governments and societies' attitude towards, towards this challenge? Uh, how uh, Turkish people uh, take care of their sav- savings, for example? Well, this is a good question. It's a very technical question. Uh, but the, the currency itself has been stable for some time now. It's, uh, it's around eight uh, lira 8.4 8.5 uh, lira per dollar uh, so it's been stable at that for quite some time uh, having of course it depends on how you look at the situation if you have um, 
if you're a country that is exporting a lot, uh, having a weak currency is good for your exports. And I guess that was the strategy. But, uh, but from the other side, uh, if you have a weak uh, currency, some of the items that you're going to buy in order to produce is going to be expensive. So it's a give and take situation. You know, which one is better, which one is not. Uh, in our case, uh, this year, for example, in the second quarter of this year, we grew by 21.7%. So this is the second highest growth rate in the OECD countries. Sorry, in the G20 countries. Uh, the UK, Great Britain was number one. They grew by 22.2%. This is in comparison to the same quarter uh, the year before. So um, we were able to grow during the pandemic. And uh, so we, we didn't have a going down a negative impact of the pandemic. Of course, our growth rate slowed down tremendously. But now we're picking up. Uh, the IMF, uh, Moody's, uh, and some other institutions are saying that we will grow around 6.5% this year. But the IMF and Moody's are never correct. At the end of the year, they always remedy their predictions concerning Turkey. It always comes up about 2% better than what they predicted. We're one of the countries where they really failed miserably. And this year, our belief is that we, we said that we would grow around 8%. With the last uh, quarter results that came out, it looks like as if we're going to grow by about 9 to 10%. So it's a huge growth rate. Tourism is a very big uh, area for us. Um, for example, we had 900,000 Poles visiting Turkey before COVID uh, struck. And during COVID, the numbers plummeted quite a lot. But now we're picking up again. I think we're either number one or number two destination for, for Pol Polish tourists coming to Turkey at the moment. And uh, we believe that it's going to pick up quite a lot. Um, so as far as inflation is concerned, inflation numbers are high um, in comparison to most other European uh, countries. Um, but our debt, debt ratio uh, is very low in comparison to many European countries, many EU countries. Like the public debt is well below 60%. So that's good in, in some sense. Um, our uh, current account deficit was very high, but now it's going down very fast. And this is due to the exports rising, more revenues coming in from tourism. Uh, but of course, um, we are a country that is, we don't have natural resources that we sell. So basically we need to produce and sell. and um, amongst the production we are moving up a scale in our production of the pro products that we're selling abroad so it's becoming more and more um, final products are becoming higher end uh, final products in industrial output in services in engineering and whatever um, and of course for that you need a lot of uh, very good um, uh, parts coming in in order to assemble them or in order to put them, you know, you don't produce everything in your own economy. So you have to bring them in, produce something as an end result. And there, of course, we have a lot of problems because our currency is weak in, in terms of uh, foreign currency. But we outset that with final sales. Okay. That's how it's going. Lately, I've heard that uh, Turkey government undertake uh, many uh, infrastructure investments. Is it true? Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's one of the one of the important sides of Turkey. Uh, Turkey in the last twenty years has done. It's like Poland, but um, you've done it with uh, a lot of help from the EU. You've had a lot of structural aid. You've had a lot of cohesion aid. You have, and you've had a lot of solidarity. You know, with this, with that, etc. Uh, within the context of Turkey, we've had to do it ourselves and uh, by borrowing. Uh, basically and doing with with our own resources now um, for example I can give you examples in terms of inf infrastructure we have now I think it's the second biggest airport in the world after the Chinese for some time Istanbul was the biggest airport now it's the second biggest airport and it's only two units of the airport is already operational uh, and already 90 million tourists can use the airport per year there's going to be two more units coming in um, another uh, project uh, is we built three of the largest bridges in the world 
um, crossing the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. Um, we've done very big underwater tunnels connecting the two sides of Asia and Europe in Istanbul, so connecting them underwater. Um, our network of trains and fast trains um, have grown by, by, I think, 400 to 500% in the last 20 years. Uh, red, uh, network of roads, it's incredible. Um, if we had, uh, let's say, I'm, I'm quoting as just as a figure to give you a comparison. If we had 2,000 kilometers of uh, motorways, for example, today we have 40,000 kilometers of motorways, for example. It's uh, the amount that we've put on uh, emphasis on infrastructure is crazy. It's one of the fastest developing um, infrastructure networks in the world. China, obviously, has done incredible, but Turkey is also an example. Another example is in, in terms of health. For example, we've done uh, incredible uh, work on health uh, because what we've done is that we've created big hospitals. People were saying, why are you creating such big hospitals in big cities? Uh, the reason was that, like this is Turkey, it, it's like a rectangle, it's, if you see it on the map. And Ankara is around here, Istanbul is around here. And you have Izmir, and you have Antalya, Adana, Diyarbakir, etc. So you had big towns, major towns. Anybody who lives around these major towns and the smaller towns, if there was something extremely important that they had to like a heart transplant or a brain surgery or something like that they needed to go to the big cities whereas what we did was instead of these people going to these big cities where there's a lot of big hospitals we did regional hospitals in between and those regional hospitals now created an environment where people from any of these districts where they don't they no longer need to go to the nearest big city but they go to the nearest a regional hospital, which is probably much more near to them than in the big city. So, if I understood well, it it, it uh, has it's been planned by geographical scheme. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So basically, near uh, where there's a demand, uh, where we see a fluctuation of people going to the big cities. You know, if if the small hospitals and small towns are not able to cater for them, they need to go to the bigger cities and bigger hospitals. But we've created now regional hospitals where they don't need to fly all the way to Istanbul or Ankara or this or that. So now they go to the regional hospitals. And this has really proven itself uh, during COVID because it helped out with the hospital beds. One of these hospitals, any one of these hospitals has a bed capacity of around starting from 500 to 3,500 hospital beds each. They're huge hospitals. Yeah, and if it, if it connects with transport infrastructure, yes. it, it will pay off. Yes, it yes. Off. It, they're all connected. They're all yeah. connected. Uh, they're all connected by uh, railway, railways and road networks. So Turkey is, is it's a G20 country in economic terms. Um, I think we're either 16th or 17th largest economy in the world. And although our purchasing, you know, when you look at the per capita income, um, it looks lower than uh, some other countries. When you look at, in reality, what is the PPP, purchasing power parity, it's higher than most European countries. So it's an interesting country, it's, it's, um, and it's developing fast. Um, but uh, we've had, in the last two years, a little bit of a, uh, how can I say, it's not stagnation, but slowing down of the growth due to COVID and other reasons of geopolitical issues happening within our also, region. Also, I guess, banks, uh, Central Bank raised the uh, effective rates. Yes, those are two technical questions for me. That I w You can answer these questions better than I can. You're, you're, you're the specialist. Uh, okay, so uh, I suggest going to international policy right now. Uh, maybe about the uh, Middle East uh, situation. Like, uh, throughout the years, uh, we, uh, saw a we saw destabilization. Middle East, starting from Syria, going to Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, uh, do you think, Mr. Ambassador, that uh, is there any chance uh, of any uh, stabilization uh, in forthcoming years? Well, uh, the Middle East, when you look at the Middle East, it's not just the Middle East. I think the whole world is going through uh, a period of um, change. When you look at um, how things are changing between um, the superpowers, uh, you look at the fact that China is has become a superpower. 
it's challenging um, the US and EU and Russia and others in terms of um, uh, you know how big it is and how developing it is etc um, and if you look at the fact that the world uh, center the, the gravity of the world uh, the center of gravity of world economics is moving eastwards all the time um, things will change things will change slowly slowly um, you have a lot of problems not only in the Middle East but in the Far East as well but in the Middle East when we look at the Middle East of course there's always been traditional players in the Middle East um, and of course there's a lot of countries um, that are being torn apart due to internal structures but also external demands put on them and also due to energy resources water resources so there are many 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 questions you have problems here in the Baltics you have problems you know with uh, with your neighbors here as well and it's the same in the Middle East it's it's a lot of geopolitics it's a lot of hard politics and it's a lot of local politics as well and don't forget that in the Middle East uh, things are never that easy because the populations are very mixed in any country there's a huge disparity between you know who is a dominant ethnic group or religious group etc and you might find 20 different ethnic groups in one country so it's easy for anyone to play around with these countries pushing them or pulling them in one direction or another yeah so we have that population uh, according to this uh, middle east situation does turkey expects uh, expect uh, next huge wave of migration and maybe uh, maybe is there any plan considered uh, with protecting southern and western not western eastern actually borders well we have we have a tradition uh, in turkey it's a hospitality tradition when you look at turkey when you go to turkey you will see that the the turkish society is very mixed you will find that in Turkey there are people of Balkan origin. More people of Balkan origin live in Turkey than all the Balkans put together. So when the Bosniaks say, I'm from Bosnia, there are more people in Turkey who, who are of Bosnian origin than Bosnia. Or more Albanian origin Turks than Albania, for example. Uh, so it's a... Uh, it, and in Turkey, you have Turks, you have Kurds, you have Armenians, you have Jews, uh, you have all sorts of national Caucasus. If you say you're Chechen, you're Circassian, you're this, you're Dalestani, etc., there are more people of those origins living in Turkey than the whole of Caucasus put together. So Turkey has always been um, a country, but also a geography when you look at it, in between East and West, always the crossroads from the Silk Road. Before that, we are, as Turks, we are the 28th civilization that is living on that land. You know, from St. Paul onwards, you've had, you, you have so many different religions, you have so many different ethnic backgrounds, etc. So it's a very mixed population. And because of that, we have a tendency to say, you know, if you're in a dire situation in and around us, and if you're coming to us, we open, we are open. And the government has kept an open border policy. Um, we have approximately 5 million refugees. No other single country in the world has that many refugees in comparison to their population. And we are taking care of not only them, but also don't forget that we're also taking care of approximately 9 million people in north of Syria. So 14 million people are being upkept. Um, now that is the first wave, first big wave that we saw uh, that was coming in from Syria in 2015 due to the ongoing war there. Now the big threat, of course, in Afghanistan is will there be a second wave? Now people are uh, very anxious. Look, we already have 300,000 Afghan refugees in Turkey. You're talking about 4,000, 5,000, look at the reaction in the street. Look how you read it, look how you react. We already have 300,000, already. But we said enough. So in, in what you're doing, for example, with your border with Belarus, we're also doing with our border with Iran. 
because what they do is they cross from Afghanistan to Iran and from Iran they come to uh, like they come from Belarus to Poland same they come from Iran to Turkey so what we did is now we're building the wall and also um, guarding the fences etc so that Afghan refugees don't come and if they do come in the future we are not going to accept it because we can't the capacity is full enough um, now the whole thing about um, migration whether be it from Syria whether be it from Afghanistan or other countries etc uh, you need to think about okay economic migration is something else but security and livelihood migration is something else if a person can no longer attain the livelihood to take care of his or her children and they're in a country where the security situation is in dire straits of course they're going to look for a place where they can live comfortably so migration is going to increase where it's going to come from the south to the north it's going to come from the east to the west and sometimes where they're situated it might even go towards the east it depends where it's going from um, so we are going to see all of us we are going to see more and more migratory movements climate change is going to ha happen as well in the Middle East you talked about the Middle East before water scarcity in Africa water scarcity uh, food scarcity all of this is going to have a tremendous effect on all of us so this is a this is a reality we all have to think about building uh, borders maintaining them it's fine but everybody has to share the burden you cannot accept or expect a single country or a couple of countries taking all of the burden when nobody else takes the burden it's not human sure Turkey has a big experience in dealing with migration policy I mean like I believe that Poland can learn from Turkey uh, in this case that's that's one of the uh, biggest uh, biggest challenges uh, in uh, future years and I believe that we should watch how Turkey policies uh, is going uh, so uh, yeah uh, and uh, moving to Polish Turkey uh, mm -hmm. Turkish relationship and uh, maybe even Ukrainian uh, because uh, there was a deal uh, with uh, Bayrak and TB2 this uh, military drones mm -hmm. uh, so do you think that uh, do you think that this deal uh, can possibly be a step towards mutual significant cooperation with between Poland, Turkey, and Ukraine? Well, uh, between Turkey and Poland, we already have significant cooperation. Uh, if you look at the Turkish-Polish relationship, uh, look at that. That's the Hotin Agreement. Uh, that's 1400s or what is it, 1600s? No, 1400s. Uh, and then from when you look at the history, we have over 600 years of relationship uh, between Turkey and Poland or between the Ottoman Empire and the then uh, Lithuanian uh, Polish. Um, you call it kingdom, right? The kingdom. Yeah? And uh, so it's over 600 years of diplomatic relationship when you think about it and social political economic relationship um, turkey and the turks were the only country um, who never recognized the partition of poland you know that's something that uh, most polish people know about they know they read this in history um, we've never accepted it uh, in our past. So we have a very good relationship. We have a place called Adampol, Polonesco in Turkey, for example, where uh, in, in the 1700s, you know, a sizable contingent of Poles uh, with the Prince Adam went to, uh, went to Turkey. Now, uh, went to the Ottoman Empire, uh, which was then. Now, uh, the relationship today is very good. We have $6 billion worth of trade, and this year we might even have $7 billion of trade. So this is the first time I'm saying it, but the figures are looking very good. Uh, tourism, we're going to each other's countries more and more. Uh, Poland is the number one destination for Turkish students who are coming to the EU with Erasmus, with Erasmus Plus uh, students. We have 3,500 Turkish students we're coming here with Erasmus. 
every year. So um, more and more um, Turkish students are learning about Poland. And we have approximately 1,800 Polish students who go to Turkey. So it's a big, uh, big number of uh, people coming and going to each other. Now, um, concerning the relationship, we've had a strategic relationship to th- since 2009. So um, buying Bayraktar or any other uh, armament from Turkey shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, we are both NATO member states. Um, and we are both uh, members of different um, international regional organizations to which we both adhere to together. And we have a very close relationship. And when you look at Poland and Turkey, we are quite similar in some ways because uh, we are situated in such a place where you know of the East, but you're of the West. We are situated in a place where we are between the East and the West. So when when you look at the, uh, what's happening geopolitically, when the East and the West collide, Poland and Turkey are the first ones to realize something is happening and you have to act fast. Uh, so we are very similar in many ways. And I, since I've been here, I've also found that your um, family structure is very similar to us. Very, very similar. And uh, that's been uh, that's been uh, very pleasant uh, to watch and to learn about. And um, now concerning uh, what's what's happening with Bayraktar, with Ukraine also, we have a very good relationship. Um, and there are neighbors uh, in the Black Sea. They're just north of us in the Black Sea. Um, so we have a very good developing relationship with them. They also have bought uh, Turkish arms um, and uh, and defense equipment. So I think Bayraktar will not be a bike car two uh, or TB two as it's known. Will not be the only. Uh, hopefully, it will not be the only arms that Poland will buy from a fellow NATO member. Uh, we are developing very fast in in the arms industry as we've developed in many other infrastructure that I've talked to you about. Um, And we are producing some very um, technologically advanced uh, systems. So it won't be a surprise if uh, Poland, Turkey, uh, other member states of NATO uh, collaborate and cooperate much more further in the future. Fantastic. And what can possibly be a significant step uh, that Poland can make to even strengthen Polish-Turkish relationship? I think we are seeing eye to eye already on many, many ways. Um, We are working very, very closely. Um, You've had the visit of President Tuda to Turkey. and He had many ministers with him and many bureaucrats and high-level dignitaries who came. So they had talks in many different fields from social issues to economic issues to cultural issues to tourism to economics to uh, development um defense industry everything you can think about even artificial intelligence or nanotechnology or uh, engineering all of these issues are areas where we can collaborate and uh, that's our job and this is what i'm trying to do as well um, your embassy in ankara and our embassy here in warsaw are working very hard to develop all the relationship in all the fields as much as we can okay so last question i would say in this official interview uh, what uh, what would you like uh, what would you like uh, for Poles to be heard about Turkey what message uh, you would like to send to Poles to young people especially well to the young uh, people in general what I would like is one thing I've realized is that Poles seem to get information about Turkey mainly from Western sources uh, and it seems to be uh, quite negative in tone. It's very similar to how Poland is being treated by Western sources of the media. Uh, you know, it's always uh, regarding human rights and democratic movements and this and that and LGBT rights, etc., etc. Um, how you are being treated in the Western media is very, very similar to how we are being treated in the Western media. It's never like this. It's never black or white. Um, so what I would recommend Poles, whether it be young or old, it doesn't matter. Go and see the country for yourself and then decide. Already hundreds of thousands, a million Poles are already going to Turkey every year. But don't go only to the beach and stay on the beach and just enjoy the sun. 
please go and see the people interact with the turks see the country itself it's a very big country very diverse country and there's a lot of similarities in our cultures okay you you have you know you're christian we are muslim but the some of the orientation of our common values family values etc it's so similar it's so similar and modern day life is the same in all countries it doesn't matter what faith you come from it doesn't matter what religion you come from so what i would recommend is go and see it for yourself and make up your own decision i'm sure that we will consider it as an invitation for sure yeah for sure. Uh, I, i've received a message that my colleague would like to ask uh, one more question yes yes, of yes course. about the uh, geopolitical future of uh, turkey because uh, you heard about uh, george friedman uh, one of the mm-hmm. most popular geopolitical, geopolitical experts in the world and uh, uh, when he wrote a book the next uh, 100 years uh, he talked about two countries that will increase uh, their uh, <coughs> uh, we can say um, geopolitical uh, position in the world yes that uh, was monaco it, and lithuania right it was all <laughs> and Turkey, yes and uh, uh, do you think uh, that uh, turkey will be we can say the leader of the arab world well a uh, turkey is not an arabic country it's a turkic country it's uh, so uh, we're not um, when you talk about turkey and the arab world it's very different um, would you be leading for example the uh, the buddhist world it's not the same thing you know it's it's very very different for us um, i think what turkey is it's a bridge between the east and west Um, I think it's uh, it's going to be a country where we are doing, for example, our trade, our economics is linked to Europe. So more than 50% of our economy is linked to Europe. Um, so we, one foot will always be in Europe uh, and one foot will be in Asia. Uh, another foot, well, we have many foots. Another foot will be in uh, <laughs> in the Middle East, where where predominantly, of course, it's uh, Arabic, but there's also Israel and there's others. Um, so basically, I think we, I, I would say it's a country that has a bright future uh, and it's developing very fast, same as Poland. And it, these are countries, like I said, Poland and Turkey, are situated in such geopolitical places that uh, we live and we understand both the east and the west both the north and the south in terms of turkey we when we look at north we understand the north when we look at south we understand the south when we look at i mean we can go around in all of this this geography and don't limit us only to the context of the arab world because we're not arab first of all uh, it's it's it, turks are a different race Um, so it's um, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. But uh, if you talk about uh, the Muslim world in that sense, for example, uh, the Muslim world also is it's very it's a big variety. You have Malaysia. Uh, you have more Muslim people in in, uh, in India than most other countries around the world. Or you have a huge uh, Muslim uh, contingent in Russia, for example. Uh, nearly 50 million people in Russia of uh, Muslim origin when you think about it. So it's 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 also a little bit of a gray area. It's not that black and white when you look at it. It's it's a long so conversation we can have another day. But I would say Poland and Turkey, I think Friedman is right. Um, I wouldn't be as um, ambitious as him to say that Turkey and Poland will become the next, you know, superpowers in the next century. But, you know, yeah, yeah. but I do agree with him that Poland and Turkey have bright futures ahead of them, both of the countries, definitely, definitely. You can say that Turkey is the leader of the region, but uh, do you think that Turkey will be the uh, member of the European uh, Union someday, maybe? Why not? Why not? It's all it's all a matter of um, developing according to You know, if you look at the European Union from the point of view of if it's going to be only Christian values, etc., if you put the value-based system on Christianity, then of course it will be difficult um, because some member states obviously do talk about this. But if you talk about um, a value-based system based on democracy, rule of law, uh, development of economic uh, relationship, etc., and how people act together and, and work together, then yes. Then yes, in the future, yes. That's that, that, that the trend, I would say. 
I hope so. I hope so. Okay. Officially, thank you. Uh, thank you for your I time. I thank you. I thank you. And good luck to, to you.